It's great to be here, and uh, uh, thanks for the good introduction, Mike. And as he said, uh, God has really laid this on our hearts to take up a ministry to further peace and shalom, not only in our church, but in our community and in our relationships. So we're excited to get this kicked off. Uh, we're just going to jump right in. So what we're going to talk about today is something that touches everyone. It's something that if you don't deal with it correctly, it can be very, very destructive. And it's something that Satan loves to use to destroy all kinds of things in your life. This has led to uh, destroying marriages, separating man from wife, uh, tearing parents from children, dividing neighbors, uh, dividing churches and believers, uh, tearing siblings from each other. Very destructive, very important, and we're excited to talk today about how to deal with that. Um, it's un as, unavo as unavoidable as the weather. If you're alive, you're going to deal with this at some point in your life and probably are dealing with some right now. It's conflict. The enemy uses it, to, as Jeremy said, to tear apart and destroy both us as people and relationships. But if we're going to talk about conflict, we want to start with peace, right? What we want to get out of conflict at the end of the day or at the end of the conflict is peace. So we need to start there to set our foundation. So we're going to talk real briefly about peace, and that's something we've talked about a lot in this church, partially because God has put this church here in this community to spread peace, and that's one of our purposes that we know. Additionally, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. That was one of his great missions, was to bring peace to us and others. So a few things about peace. People are hungry for peace, right? It's hard to find somebody that truly would say, I love conflict. I love fighting and being stressed out. People are hungry for peace. Our world is hungry for peace, right? Unfortunately, our world looks for peace in all the wrong places. And we're hoping today to show you where and how to do that. Jeremiah 6.14 <clears throat> says, They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. That shows man's attempts to make peace and how it so often fails. Real peace is a priority to God. He didn't just send anybody to give us peace. Who did he send? He didn't send an army. He didn't send angels. He sent his son. He sent Jesus. It's a priority. It's top priority for him. Real peace is expensive. Consider the price that was paid to purchase our peace. What price would you put on those services? What price would you put on what Jesus did for you? And if we desire peace in our life with those relationships and those people around us, we have to realize that that comes at a cost as well, and that's expensive. Real peace is found only in one place, and it's found only at the cross. The greatest conflicts that we face are not really physical, they're more spiritual and we need a spiritual remedy. Jesus' death and resurrection is the only thing, the only way we can have real peace in our lives. And it happens when we surrender our will to his and allow his work at the cross to change us. Real peace has eternal consequences. Certainly it's easy to see that when we think about Jesus dying for our sins and about that eternal peace that we have between us and God. But also peace with your friends and your family and those relationships, those can have eternal consequences as well. Real peace is uh, shalom. It's not just the absence of conflict. It's, it's shalom. And it, we have three dimensions that, that I want to talk about. We have peace with God, peace with ourselves, and peace with others. Now, peace with God is salvation. 
when we sin, we sep we're separated from God, and the penalty is death. But at the cross, Jesus took our penalty and gave us his perfection, making it possible for us to have peace with God. And then there's peace with ourselves. Shalom is not just lack of conflict, again, it's a sense of wholeness, contentment, tranquility, order, rest, security. And just like Mike said, if you have none of that, or, or you're, you're all chaos inside, and you have junk, and you're struggling with depression, or anxiety, or fear, come to Freedom Weekend. You'll get rid of it for good, and you'll know how to deal with it when it tries to creep back in. And then what we want to talk about is today is the peace with others, and that's uh, called unity. And it's something, you know, last week Aaron talked about smells and how we smell to people. Unity is huge. I think how we handle conflict is directly related to how we smell to other Christians and to the lost and dying world. Sometimes we need to think about how we're reflecting Jesus to the lost world if we're always seeking to push our own advantage in a conflict. If we're gossiping or slandering or if we're venting, you know, it's... And sometimes we need to talk to somebody, but find a mature Christian to talk to, say, at one time, in that one place, and that's it. It's not venting, it's gossip. It's, and disrespect causes disunity. And I'm not talking about disrespect, you know, disrespecting church leaderships, but how do we respect those in authority over us? Teachers, coaches school administration, law enforcement, our mayors, our bosses, our husbands, our wives. Are we disrespectful? We need unity. Unity is not the absence of conflict and strife. It is the presence of genuine harmony and understanding and goodwill between people. We all like the sound of peace, right? <clears throat> and even more, we know Jesus brought peace to this world, and he called us to be peacemakers in our world, to take that peace out to others, and to take that God's method for resolving conflict to ultimate peace to others around us. And in a world that seems so hungry and desperate for peace, we have to realize our role in that, and that we've been called and anointed and empowered to bring that peace to the world and help address that conflict. Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Notice it doesn't say peacekeeper, but peacemaker. Sometimes it's very easy to keep the peace by avoiding something, but we're called to be a peacemaker, to take that peace that Jesus brings into those around us. So now that we've talked about peace, let's go back to conflict, because that's what we're here to talk about. And uh, in order to get a good picture of that, we're going to have uh, Isaac and Emily come up here and help us out. And these two are uh, embroiled in a sibling rivalry, and they're going to pick up an end of this chain here, one on each end. It's a heavy chain, too. And now we're going to talk about conflict. In the physical, conflicts start from difference of opinions. Maybe it's a difference of values or goals or expectations. Maybe it's miscommunication or competition over time or money. Maybe it's a wrong attitude or a wrong habit. And uh, so they're, they're fighting over something. I don't know, who gets to play the PlayStation or something? I don't know. And they, they make a choice to grab the chain. It's a choice to pick it up and pull. And when one person gets pulled, the other person gets pulled. And then the other person pulls back, and it's just they're tied together through this conflict. And then all of a sudden, their focus probably changes. They start to get tunnel vision, and they only care about the chain. They only care about winning. Re the re requests and desires and expectations, they morph into demands, and they're demanding victory. 
I want the result that I want. The other person doesn't matter. Winning and making my point matters. I need to have the last word and I'm gonna say it and I'm gonna do it. There's no thought towards God. The other person, again, they're not caring about the other person, they're caring about winning. My, my Christian witness is not thought about. Nor is compromise or resolution or reconciliation, that's not even in the picture. I don't even wanna be in the same room, I just wanna win. We can get so focused on pulling the chain that we forget, that maybe don't even remember the initial issue. And we can also start to build coalitions. So she's not gonna win her fight on her own, so she needs to go get somebody to f fight with her. So now he's sensing that he's outnumbered, so he has, has, does the same thing and he builds his coalition. And somebody, and so you gather an army. Even it, maybe, maybe the situation just gets dropped or forgotten but there always seems to be some kind of chain connecting them, and they're bound together through that. Satan loves this, by the way. He instigates it, and he wants us to participate in it, and he excels at it, and he manipulates our feelings so that we start making decisions based on feelings and what we feel instead of by the word of God, and, and we just start getting worse and worse. It's also good to know that this isn't may not just be a little sibling rivalry or a relational thing, it may be a legal dispute. It may be a dispute that we fight because we view something as unfair. I mean, that's huge in our culture right now. That's not fair. Well, life's not fair. It's not meant to be fair. We're supposed to reflect God and it's not, Satan does not fight fair. He does not care. Even if we're right, even if we are absolutely 100% right, we're still not to fight. We must handle dispute and conflict biblically and lovingly. James um, 4, 1 through, and 2 says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Your arm's getting tired? <laughs> That's the other part about conflict, is that chain gets heavy, and it's weary, and it wears us down. And so often, we view conflict just as Steph described, but the extra step that we need to take is to really see what's going on spiritually when this happens, right? The Bible tells us what occurs in the spiritual realm, realm is much more real than what's in the physical. So in the spiritual realm, we have a partnership with pride. We have a partnership with anger. We have a partnership with bitterness. We have a partnership with unforgiveness. Uh, we have a partnership with resentment, right? And Satan takes all that and stirs it up and just fuels the fire to get everybody fired up and fighting at each other. The problem is when we partner, as we know, with the enemy, then we open doors and kind of give up some control in our life. Have you ever been in a conflict or experienced something where you did or said something that you just can't believe you did? It's like, well, that's not me, but boy, I sure said it. Well, you're under the influence of the enemy when you do that because you've partnered with him. Your desire to win that fight has brought you to a point where you've invited the enemy in. So when we talk about addressing conflict, it's more than just what we can do in the physical. We have to approach this from a spiritual side as well, which is why Jesus is the Prince of Peace and the only answer. We cannot solve spiritual problems with physical or man-made solutions. And we have to use the authority of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit to address this. James 13, or excuse me, James 3, 14 to 18 says, But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. 
Such wisdom, wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Can you see that spiritual description right there of what happens in conflict? A spiritual problem needs a spiritual remedy. So we go on to verse 17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. We need God's remedy, that spiritual remedy for how we address conflict in our lives. Okay? You guys can just drop the chain, thanks. Just drop it right there. <laughs> so think about for a minute the spiritual aspects of some conflict that you may be in. Try to look at that through the lens of the spiritual side. And I'm sure you can identify uh, many of these things that are going on. We need a biblical approach to addressing conflict, and we've been given that path. But we seldom look to God's word in resolving conflict, and we seldom look to God's goals for resolving conflict, and that's partly because we don't really know what they are. Our goal is in a conflict is that we want to win and make the other person look bad. God's goal in conflict, he wants shalom, he wants restoration and reconciliation of the relationship. We want justice. He wants justice, he wants shalom. His justice is not ours. Forgiveness is awesome and it's, we need that, but it's the first step. We have to go beyond forgiveness and step into reconciliation. We need to step into restoring that relationship. We have a responsibility as believers and a church to biblically resolve conflict. We'll take a little aside here. <clears throat> this is exactly the reason that Steph and I see a need and feel called to start this ministry. Uh, because we know in our own lives, we're not here because we're experts, we're here because our own efforts have failed so many times, and we know that God's way is the only way that lasts. Uh, our church, our church body, and we as believers have a responsibility to help others resolve conflict and to do it in a biblical way. So we're hoping, well not hoping, this ministry will equip us better to do that, allow us to be resources that we can use uh, and be used by those that are in conflict. Uh, we're going to kick this off this summer uh, with a course, an eight-week course, that you may be interested in. It's just called Resolving Everyday Conflict, and it really steps through God's path and his plan for resolving conflict. So we've got a quick little video here we're going to play. If this is something you're interested in, uh, you can sign up at the Connections desk. If you have any questions, let us know. Watch a quick video, and then we'll get back to the message. I, I, I want to take it easy. Work's been hard this year. I want to go to the beach. What's the problem? Yeah, but we went to the beach last year. Because yeah. of the same reason. Yeah, and we got to relax. We got to take it easy. That's what I'm talking about. That's not what I meant. And you know that. Yes, the beach was fun. We all had a great time. But my father is not going to be around forever. And I don't want to feel like I missed this opportunity to spend time with him. I don't know why we always have to go through this. I wish you could just... How many of us have a kitchen that looks a bit like that, at least some of the time? simple discussion about where we're going on vacation is suddenly this full-blown argument between two people who love each other. Conflict shows up everywhere in our lives. Maybe it's not the big blow up, but just those everyday difficult situations uh, in our kitchens, you know, uh, with our kids, in our dorm rooms, in our neighborhoods, and at the places we work. 
Remember, you said you were going to send me that worksheet so I'd only have to enter them once. We talked about that. That was the whole point of the worksheet, only having to do it once. That's fine for you, but now I'm going to look stupid because we're the only group that doesn't have its numbers done because you didn't do that. Oh, hey, wait a minute. That's not fair. This isn't my fault. You didn't send me... The problem with conflict is we can't pretend it doesn't affect us. It wears us down, builds up walls, and tears down relationships. Maybe you haven't spoken to your sister for five years. And how often do you find yourself just in the same conflict again and again, maybe with your spouse, just like that wife who said, why do we have to keep going through this? Wouldn't it be great if there were some real answers, the answers we're all looking for? Well, I've got some good news for you. The Bible has a lot to say about relationships and conflict and where conflict comes from, but best of all, how we can work through conflict in a completely different way. Resolving Everyday Conflict is an eight-week group study that unpacks many of these wonderful truths. How many of you here have kids? Any of you said to your kids, can't you just get along? Yep. How did that work? Not so well, is my guess. You maybe got five minutes out of it if you were lucky. Jesus addresses conflict and he says, there's a place you start in conflict and it's not with the other guy. You start with yourself. What is your contribution? When we deny a conflict exists, when we just avoid it, when we pretend it's not there, it's like a ticking bomb. It's just waiting uh, to go off. Unforgiveness is the poison we drink hoping someone else will die. But the question we need to ask is, where's God in all this? What does God think about this conflict? Maybe the question isn't, how do I win? Maybe the question is, what would please and honor God in this situation? So we would like to invite you to come along and join the study. It's a lot of fun, maybe bring a friend. It's not churchy or churchy language. It's just practical answers to this everyday problem. It's what God has to say uh, about conflict. You know, a lot of people remodel their, how their kitchen looks, uh, and that's fine. But you would be amazed at what can happen when God remodels what's going on inside your kitchen. So once again, real briefly, if you're interested, you can uh, <clears throat> talk to Steph or I or sign up, sign up uh, at the Connections desk. So we've talked about conflict. We keep saying we have to follow God's path, but what is that? There's really four steps that the Bible gives us, and there's an order to them. One, two, three, four, and we'll jump into that right now. The first step is to glorify God. This should be our number one goal in everything. That's why we exist, that's our purpose, is to glorify God. But even in conflict, we need to glorify God. We need to ask ourselves, how can I please and honor God in this situation? I know for me, when I'm in a, in a conflict, especially in the beginning of a conflict, the, the best thing that God has told me is I need to praise him and bless them. I need to praise and worship, be on my face if I need to be, and worship him. He is God and he's in control. I trust you, God. I trust you with my life. I trust you with this situation. You are awesome. You're wonderful. And I need to bless bless their marriage, bless their finances, bless, just speak blessing it's, and God's intention over their life to be fulfilled. That's what, that's what I have to do. So step one is to glorify God. So after you've focused on how you can glorify God in this conflict, then we need to get ourselves right. We need to get the log out of our own eye. Uh, Jesus asks us to take care of our own contribution to the problem before addressing our, other, our brother's issue. This takes great humility to do that, but if you do it, it casts out pride. Uh, instead of blaming others for a conflict or resisting correction, we need to trust in God's mercy and take responsibility for our own contribution to conflicts. Confessing our sins to those we have wronged asking God to help us change any attitudes and habits that we have that have led to the problem. Matthew 7, 3 and 5 says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time 
there is a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly, clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I know in my experience and some of the struggles I've had, I tend to want to take that verse and apply it to someone else and say, well, you need to clean your act up before you tell me what to do, right? But Jesus is clearly talking to us directly. We need to recognize our own contribution before we approach our brother. Glorify God, get the speck out of your own eye. The next one is to gently restore. Uh, Matthew 18, 15 through 17 says, if your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he won't listen, take one or two more with you so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If he pays no attention to them, tell the church. But, but if he does pay attention, if he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like an unbeliever and a tax collector to you. Now for myself, I kind of have a problem with that and I've struggled with that. And I think the reason why we struggle with that is because we look at that verse through a filter of how we've been shown to handle conflict. We look at it through a judgmental and a religious spirit. We look at it where the focus is on the sin, what you did to me. The result is rejection and guilt and shame and condemnation and every other evil thing. But if you look at the context of that verse in scripture, the context is not judgmental, it's relational. He talks about humility. He talks about a welcoming attitude and he kind of hints on how we treat how we should treat our children. We get God's heart on some, on some of that. The parable of the lost sheep is in there. He seeks the lost. The parable of the unmerciful servant is there, <laughs> showing mercy and extending forgiveness. So the context of this is not judgmental. It's to, to build relationships. It's to build us up. It's to reconcile us. The focus is that. Notice in the first part where it says, if your brother sins against you, not, not a difference of opinion, not I'm annoyed with you. It's if, he, if there's a sin there. It's not offense. It's not you did something wrong and I'm just offended. It's actual sin. You didn't do something the way I wanted you to. So now I'm here to let you know about it. That's not, what, <laughs> that's not what that verse is. Instead of pretending the conflict doesn't exist or, not, or talking about it with others behind their backs, gently restore means we will overlook minor, minor offenses or we will talk personally and graciously with those whose offenses seem to be too serious to overlook, seeking to restore them rather than condemn them. When a conflict with a Christian brother or sister cannot be resolved in private, we will ask others in the body of Christ to help us settle the matter in a biblical manner. I think that a great example that Jesus gave us is the Samaritan woman when he talked to her. And even in the heading, it says Jesus talks with a Samaritan woman. He didn't talk down to her. He didn't point out her sin. He talked he didn't talk at her, just rapid fire talking at her. They talked with each other. And what was the result of that? The result of that was not only her being reconciled to God, but many Samaritans were saved because of that conversation. So we need to glorify God and get the log out of our own eye and gently restore. And then the fourth step <clears throat> is to go and be reconciled. Jesus asks us to take action. He doesn't ask us to sit by and wait for someone else to come up, come to us. And how often do we do that, or how often have we seen that happen where there's a quarrel, there's something going on, and you're just like, well, you know, he messed with me. I'm just, I'm, if he wants to make peace with me, I'm right here waiting for him, right? That is not what Jesus said to do. And praise God, thank God that Jesus did not do that to us, right? He sought us out. He continually seeks us out. 
He seeks us out to reconcile us, and we're asked to do the same with others. Matthew 5, 23 and 24 says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, and see, it doesn't say that you have something against them. They have something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. This thought of going out and seeking reconciliation is so important to Jesus that he said, you're at the altar, you're there to worship me, you're there to give me a gift. If, you, uh, if there's something out there, leave it and go and take care of it. That's how important relationships and peace and resolved conflict are to Jesus. He takes us to act... He asks us to take action and not sit by. How many relationships could have been saved if people took this to heart? Maybe in your own lives, maybe in those around you. You know, that selfish pride to just sit there and, you know, I'm not going to do it. They want to deal with this, they can come to me. Instead of accepting premature compromise or allowing relationships to wither, we need to actively pursue genuine peace and reconciliation. Forgiving others as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. We need to go and be reconciled. Why don't we have the worship team come forward at this point? And then we'll also have the prayer team come forward as well. In summary, we just, no, we're not per <laughs> perfect. Like Jeremy said, we're here because we have failed to do this in our own lives, and we want God's way. We want a reconciliation with our relationships between our brothers and sisters. We want unity. We want that. So God deals with conflict different than we do, and he asks us, to do it his way. It's more than just forgiveness, like I said. Jesus didn't just forgive us, he restored us and reconciled us to him. And our goal should be the same in our relationships. Is forgiveness, yes, that is so important and it's a first step, but we need to go and be reconciled. We need restoration. God's idea of success in conflict is when shalom is restored with him first. So if you haven't been reconciled to God, today's the day, right now. If you have not received Jesus as your personal savior, today is the day. Make peace. <laughs> There's probably not golf later, so do. <laughs> <laughs> so make peace with God. The time is now. Make peace with, between God and yourself. Come to Freedom Weekend. If you have something, an issue right now that you're struggling with right now, come pray. Don't leave the doors without it, without that peace. Don't leave. And then with others. We need peace with others. We need unity in our body. The Bible says that we, <laughs> the world will know. They'll come to salvation because of our love for each other. That unity, we need that. It's more spiritual than physical, conflict is. We need a spiritual remedy. It requires one. Jesus is our peace. And we have, as a believer in Christ, we have a responsibility to be a peacemaker. And we need to change the way we view conflict. Conflict can be an opportunity to glorify God by allowing him to restore and reconcile relationships in ways that we can't even imagine. Well, as we've talked about, conflict is all around us. We know that. You know it. You see it in your life. You deal with it. You may have experienced the destruction that conflict brings in your family, in your marriage, uh, in your relationships. But we know that the only lasting cure is God's plan, right? We need to try to glorify God in every conflict. 
we need to get ourselves right first. Get that log out of your own eye. You need to try to restore that relationship and you need to go and be reconciled, just as Jesus did, right? If he would have stopped at forgiveness, then we wouldn't have that reconciliation of his love and his peace, and we wouldn't have been restored as heirs to the throne, you know, sitting in heaven with him. And those are the steps that he shows us that we need to make with others around us. So today, as Steph said, if you don't have peace with God, there's only one path to that. The Bible's very clear, and that is through Jesus Christ. Uh, as we close here with some worship, we have our prayer partners up front. Uh, I would encourage you to come forward if a couple of these things apply to you. If you need peace with God, come and talk to him. You can, Jesus is sitting there waiting and ready and anxious for you to come forward and accept his forgiveness. Maybe you have some friends or family that are in a conflict, and maybe you've stood to the side. Maybe you've chosen not to get in the middle of it or not to offer God's wisdom. Maybe you need prayer for strength and wisdom to help some friends or family work through a conflict that they currently have. We've got to quit standing to the side and allowing relationships to be destroyed. We need to rise up and take an active role in that. And lastly, maybe you're currently in a conflict. Maybe there's someone out there that you've seen that destruction firsthand. Maybe you need to go and be reconciled. Maybe you need to need that power of God to help you identify that log in your own eye so that you can go and restore that relationship and rebuild that. If any of that applies to you, I would really encourage you not to leave today without taking this opportunity to do that. This could be the one step today that leads to reconciliation. Maybe that cousin you haven't talked to in 20 years. Maybe your mom that you haven't phoned for two years. Whatever it may be, that's not Jesus' desire. And that's not the life that he died on the cross for us to live. So please come forward. Start to make some peace today.